Welcome back to our final lesson in the book of Acts. We're looking at Paul and his situation in Rome as a prisoner. 28 verse 19 says, But when the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, not to any charge to bring against my own people. In these words, Paul is assuring his Jewish audience that when his case is heard by Caesar, he will not say anything inflammatory against the Jews, for that would only cause the government to bring more hardship on the Jews. Paul speaks with kindness and courtesy to these Jews in Rome about the opposition of the Jews in Judea against him. He uses conciliatory words and phrases such as brethren, our people, our fathers, the hope of Israel, and not that I had any accusation. Paul exhibits that sweetness and lack of retaliation that Jesus expects of his followers as he tells how he cherished no unkind feelings towards those who had done him wrong. Paul now shares with them the exact reason he invited them to come to speak with him. He desired to clear himself of whatever false reports may have been sent to Rome or that, that the Jews visiting Jerusalem from Rome might have heard about him there. Paul is a prisoner in chains. He must explain why he is a prisoner to their satisfaction before they would ever listen to the gospel. <clears throat> it says, the hope of Israel. This is not the first time in these closing chapters of Acts we had this refrain. We've spoken on at least two occasions. The hope of Israel. Acts 23, 36 says, uh, verse 6 says, And Paul, knowing that some of them were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, called out to the Sanhedrin, My brothers, I am a Pharisee, the son of a Pharisee. I stand on trial because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. 26, 68, And now it is because of my hope and what God has promised our fathers that I am on trial today. This is a promise our twelve tribes are hoping to see fulfilled as they earnestly serve God day and night. O King, it is because of this hope that the Jews are accusing me. Why, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? Paul is emphasizing the message which he is proclaiming. Far from undermining the cherished beliefs and customs of Israel was its divinely appointed fulfillment. How much the Jews' audience permitted him to enlarge in this statement before they replied to the feeling of a need to defend himself, we do not know. One other, on another day when they return, Paul will have an opportunity to explain that when they still look for, for, for explain that what they still look for in the future, Paul knows has already happened, namely that the Messiah has come, the Messiah has set up his kingdom, the Messiah now offers life and immortality to all. This whole presentation was calculated to win the sympathy of the Jewish leaders. It was not no uncommon thing for Jews to be persecuted, especially because they cherished their hope. Paul even speaks of this chain to show that he is sharing the common experience of many a Jew. In passing, the mention of the chain in the singular agrees with the fact stated in verse 16. He was entrusted to the keeping of a single soldier. They said to him after hearing Paul's explanation of his, of his own personal situation, some of them spoke up and assured him that they had little information about him and no official information against him had come to them. Letters, grammata in this case, must mean official documents from the Sanhedrin containing charges against Paul. They do not say they never heard of Paul or of Paul's religion. What they do affirm is that no official charge had been sent out against them by the Sanhedrin. Such official letters were often sent by the Sanhedrin to outlying Jewish communities to inform them of official decisions or to warn them of doctrinal deviations or teachers to be avoided. At first sight, they may seem so surprised that no letters have been sent by Paul either before or after his departure from Caesarea to Rome. Verse 21 says, We have not received any letters from Judea concerning you. None of the brothers who have come there has reported or said anything bad about you. During his two-year imprisonment, perhaps the Jews in Judea felt secure in the thought that if he ever walked out of the Roman custody and protection, he would not walk far until he was dead. So they sent no warning letters to the synagogues. When he did finally appeal to Caesar, it was late in the sailing season, and the Jews would have had difficulty getting a letter to Rome before Paul himself got there. Verse 22 says, But we desire to hear from you what your views are, for concerning the sect it is known to us that is spoken about against everywhere. 
That is, although we have heard nothing against you that would invalid your, validate your statements or the cause of your imprisonment, Paul, we've heard of, your, of the religion which you have been preaching. The word desire really means we think it right. Your views must not be pressed to mean that Paul taught a special view of Christianity different than, say, Peter or John talk, taught. But Christianity was different from the views of the synagogue and the community leaders among the Jews at Rome. These Jewish leaders are certainly being very open and fair with Paul. Paul didn't regard Christianity as a sect in the way the Jews regarded it. To him it was not a split off the official Jewish religion, but the rightful fulfillment of their whole religion. Paul introduced this whole subject by his reference to the hope of Israel. And now the Jews say, we want to hear what you have to say about the predicted Messiah having come and having set up his kingdom. The Jewish leaders mean that Christianity is spoken against by Jews. This further possibility to everywhere spoken against is true of what many Gentiles thought of Christianity. We know some of the things Gentiles were saying about the Christians. When the Christians are suffering under Nero, Tacitus described them as holding a detestable superstition, guilty of atrocious, shameful crimes, convicted by the hatred of mankind. Sounds like good news. Suetonius writes that Christians are a race of men holding a new criminal superstition. A character, character of Christian convert, a character, caricature of a Christian convert named Alexander Minos, kneeling before a figure hanging across the figure of a man with the head of an ass, has this inscription: "Alexos worships his god." From Tacitus. They arranged to meet Paul on a certain day and come in even larger numbers to the place he was staying. From morning till evening he explained and declared to them the kingdom of God and tried to convince them about Jesus from the law of Moses and the prophets. Paul's explanation of his being held in custody has been satisfactory in the minds of the Jews and so they have no hesitation from that, that account to hear Paul's explanation of the hope of Israel. The Greek for large numbers is a comparative adjective implying a larger attendance than might have been expected. Perhaps the leading men have done some advertising, sharing at synagogue services an announcement made about the opportunity to hear Paul. Explain is a verb we have had before in Acts 11.4 in 1826, in this case as before, it implies a detailed and comprehensive explanation. Luke doesn't give us any more than the barest outline of the things that were discussed that day, or the evidences that Paul presented to the Jews. It is to be assumed that Paul used the same line of argument we've seen before in the book of Acts, which argument also is given in fuller detail in some of Paul's letters, namely Romans and Galatians. Some say Paul wrote the book of Hebrews because many of the same kind of arguments presented in that book, which was directed to the Jews, are the same as he would have used to convince these Roman Jews. By solemnly testifying about the kingdom of God, included would be an explanation of how the church is a fulfillment of prophecies of a coming kingdom, dealing with Daniel, etc. Included would be the great doctrines of justification, sanctification and glorification through Jesus the Christ. Paul spoke of the kingdom of God. He would not be speaking of, of any of those carnal notions that many Jews held today and still hold today. Paul would have been talking about the spiritual nature of the kingdom, as is the case all through Acts, with the exception of Acts 14.22, which refers to the church triumphant. Persuade, in the Greek, suggests he was reasoning with, trying to convince them that Jesus of Nazareth was the Messiah, to which the law and the prophets both look forward. Paul certainly laboured to prove to them that the gospel of Christ was a true and necessary fulfilment of Israel's religion of the Old Testament history and prophecy. His text was the whole volume of Hebrew scripture interpreted by the events of the advent, the passion and the triumph of Jesus Christ. The same Old Testament passages have been appealed to to a number of times in Acts, would have been studied, and more as well. We can imagine the appeal to the ordinances, the sacrifices, the priesthood, the prophecies of the Mosaic dispensation in their significance as preparatory for the coming of the Christ. Just as Jesus had done years before with two men on the road to Emmaus, and with the disciples in the upper room, Paul would have exposed how the Christ is seen and fulfilled in all of the scriptures. 
Paul now begins with Moses and the prophets and expounds to them all things concerning Jesus. Jesus said the law and prophets testified of him. If a Jew didn't believe and accept the teaching of the law and the prophets, he will never believe that Jesus is the true Messiah of Israel and the Saviour of the world. We would probably be mistaken if we assumed that Paul did all the talking through the whole day. Instead, we must picture questions and answers followed by further teaching and appeals made to additional passages in the Old Testament. Every separate proposition was supported by an appeal to the proper verse of Scripture. We should remember these people were not bound to clocks, and the topic under discussion was one that had to do with both time and eternity. Paul had sufficient time to place his whole teaching before them in some detail. Verse 24 says, Some were convinced by what he said, but others would not believe. The Gospel made its customary division between believers and unbelievers. Some of Paul's hearers were receptive to truth. They were in the process of being persuaded. It seems that the people who came to hear Paul on this set day were pretty, pretty evenly divided in their response. The implication of the following verses is that the ones who were being persuaded had enough conviction to begin to argue with the unbelievers that what Paul had presented must be right. Verse 25, they disagreed among themselves and began to leave after Paul had made his final statement. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your forefathers when he said through Isaiah the prophet, Perhaps we can picture the audience taking up the argument among themselves, much as happened among the Pharisees and Sadducees at Jerusalem a couple of years earlier. Then the unbelievers spoke with such heat that Paul applied to them the condemnation of God against those who refused his message. It may even be that the disagreement led to some altercation at the ex ex exhibition of the usual bigotry and prejudice and bitter opposition on part of the unbelieving Jews. We can think of the words being addressed in particular to unbelieving Jews. Through this whole day, Paul has been turning to passages from the Old Testament to show that what had happened in the coming of Jesus and the beginning of the Kingdom of God was just as God had predicted it would be. Very appropriately, he turns to one more passage in the Scriptures and shows that even what had happened this day was just as God had predicted it would be. The Holy Spirit rightly spoke. Here the Apostle distinctly asserts the inspiration of the Old Testament prophet Isaiah. Rightly represents Callus. Beautifully, what the Spirit led Isaiah to record fits this situation beautifully, he says. Paul is quoting the Septuagint almost word for word. Verse 26 says, Go to this people and say, You will ever hearing, you will be ever hearing, but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. This passage is quoted a number of times in the New Testament. Jesus quoted it on the day he preached his sermon in parables. John, the Gospel writer, alludes to it just after he recorded Jesus' last public sermon before his crucifixion. What had been the response of the Jews 700 years before Christ to measure from God was the same response of the Jews to God's own Messiah today. There was a willful blindness, a willful deafness to that which ought to produce conviction and conversion. Verse 27, For this people have heart to be calloused, they hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. There was a willful blindness, a willful deafness to that which ought to have produced conviction and conversion. Paul is saying in the words of God to Isaiah that there are none so deaf as those who refuse to hear. There are none so blind as those who refuse to see. If they had to see and hear and understand, they would have given up the pleasure of sin they are currently enjoying, their selfish living, their wicked ways. Because this is the very thing they do not want to do, they harden their hearts of the gospel. The words of Isaiah are true of the numbers of men who are not Jews. This passage from Isaiah illustrates once more from the book of Acts that the doctrine of irresistible grace is not found in the Bible. The Calvinist idea that you have no option but to be saved if God decides to save you. Here are people who deliberately turn their back on the message of the, of the Gospel. The doctrine would say these Jews didn't believe because they had no direct and immediate re regeneration work by the Holy Spirit on these men's hearts. That's not the case. The Gospel is the hearts of men are opened by 
uh, healing of the Word of God. We follow that some of Paul's healers went away unbelievers because of a diet, or because of divine influence was help, withheld from him while it was granted to others. So God is a, a, a person, a, God is a respecter of persons, and that's not true. The text says the real reason some believed and others disbelieved is that those who disbelieved deliberately plugged their ears and shut their eyes. Remember that? We've come across that quite a number of times. Remember when Stephen was preaching? That's exactly what they did. They put their hands over their ears to shut off the message of, of uh, Stephen. Just as they closed them voluntarily, they had the power to keep them open. And it's implied that had, had they done so, the result would have been reversed. The reason the gospel was or was not received rested with the will of the hearers rather than any direct work of the Holy Spirit on their hearts. Turning again would include repentance and obedience. They didn't allow themselves to be convinced by what Paul was sharing with them about the Messiah because they didn't want to turn away from their lifestyle to repent. Paul, in verse 28, says, Therefore, I want, to know, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Paul sadly sounds a note of warning to these willful disbelieving Jews. We remember how he loved his Jewish kinsmen, how he had a great sorrow and unceasing grief in his heart because of the refusal to come to Christ, seen in Romans 9 verse 1. It is not that he's giving up on these Jews after only one sermon, but that by speaking of how the Gentiles will respond, he is hoping to provoke the Jews to follow also, as we see him used in Romans 11 verse 14. What Paul had said in Pisidian Antioch, at Corinth and elsewhere, he now says with reference to Rome. The very method of deliverance which God gave in fulfilment of the Old Testament prophecy will be embraced by the Gentiles. The Jews could reject their salvation for themselves, as a nation, but that wouldn't destroy the kingdom of God or prevent Messiah from reigning over his kingdom. He would reign over the hearts of the Gentiles who responded to his gracious offer of salvation on the condition of an obedient faith. They will really listen. The Gentiles would embrace God's meaning of salvation if only they were given the opportunity to hear about it. Verse 29 says, And when he had spoken these words, the Jews departed, having a great dispute among themselves. This whole verse is not found in some codexes and appears in the margin of the New American Standard Bible. It does describe accurately, probably, what happened after Paul had his closing words with him. Perhaps the verse was written on the margin of some ancient manuscript to relive, relieve the apparent abruptness of the count between verses 28 and 30, if it is omitted. omitted. A study says for two whole years Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. If you've been wondering where the money came from to pay the rent, we may look to help from his friends, like the missionary off offering from Philippi that had been brought from the brethren there by Epaphroditus. From these rented quarters during these two years will come five of the letters which are now contained in our New Testaments. The letters to Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, a thank you a letter for the missionary offering, Philemon, and if you believe Paul wrote Hebrews, then possibly Hebrews. You will remember that in the early lessons we said that this was the lim limit of time a man had to wait for his pr prosecutors to arrive to press charges, two years. We think that at the time Luke writes, Acts, Paul's two years waited just over, his accusers having come and he automatically has been set at liberty because they didn't turn up. Paul was a prisoner during these two years and was limited as to where he could go, but was not limited as to who might come and visit him, just as the leaders of the Jewish community already had done. Paul was not allowed to go to the synagogues or to the congregations or to the houses of this or that disciple or to homes where teaching was needed to win converts. That might seem at first to be a hindrance to his evangelistic work, but what at first seems a hindrance, as he himself afterwards acknowledged, turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. His presence in Rome stimulated others to renewed evangelistic activity. All indicates both Jew and Gentiles were welcome. It also implies he had many visitors. From his letters written during these two years, we learn that Paul had a number of faithful co-workers and helpers who carried his message to the city and brought many 
to receive preaching and instruction from him. Luke, the beloved physician who shared the perils of the voyage from Caesarea to Rome, was his constant co-worker. Timothy was last mentioned by name during the carrying of the offering to Jerusalem, is united with him in salutations of Colossians, Philippians, Philemon and Philippians, so he must have come to Paul while Paul was still in custody in Rome. Mark, who once quit as a helper during the first mission journey, was backing Paul's good graces, had come to him in Rome and was about to set off on a distant journey at Paul's request. Aristarchus has joined Paul in Rome. Demas, who some years later will forsake Paul because he loved this present world, was as yet by Paul's side. Epaphras, a preacher who served with several congregations in the Lycus River Valley of Asia, has come to Rome in the capacity of a messenger for those congregations Colossae, Laodicea and Hierapolis. Tychicus, the Ephesian, who had gone with Paul to Jerusalem, had also found his way to Rome. While at Rome, or on the way to Rome, Epaphroditus had become sick near unto death, the Philippian writer says. Paul's writing the Philippians says. Someone who visited Philippi after this told the Philippians about his sickness, and news had also gone back to Rome that the health of their messenger was a concern to the brethren at Philippi. A Jew named Jesus, who was also named Justice, was also among Paul's fellow workers at Rome. The preaching would be mostly to unbelievers, and the teaching would be especially to those who were already Christians, even while a prisoner. Paul fulfilled the preaching and teaching functions commanded in the Great Commission. All the while in Rome, Paul was saved the hardships, the persecutions and the afflictions that had often attended his preaching in the cities of Greece, Macedonia and Asia Minor. Acts is brought to a close then on this triumphant note. The Kingdom of God and the story of Jesus are openly proclaimed and taught in Rome itself. Paul's activities described. Paul preached the Kingdom of God. Paul taught the things that concerned the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul did everything with confidence. Paul didn't allow anyone to forbid him to preach the gospel. Many guesses have been made about why Luke ends his history of Paul and the early assemblies with Paul's two years in Rome. But every story must end. Perhaps Luke thought this was as good a place as any to bring the story to an end. There are clues in Paul's letters written to Rome to Timothy that hint that he was released for a short time then re-arrested and executed shortly after. Tradition says he was beheaded under Nero in 65 AD. We may think it was a tragic waste for Paul to be placed in prison for so long. Paul says the Philippians, Now I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and everyone else, I am in chains for Christ. Because of my chains, most of the brothers in law have been encouraged to speak the word of God more courageously and fearlessly. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. I know how to get along with humble means. I also know how to live in prosperity. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. I can do all things. Through him who strengthens me. After this imprisonment, Paul's departure, verse, 1 Timothy 4 6 says, For I am already been poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. I fought a good fight, I finished the course, I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. By the time Paul arrives in Rome, the personal service of the, service of the Apostles of Christ has been growing less and less important. Many congregations have established throughout the Roman world, many preachers and teachers are doing the necessary work. There are still inspired letters to be written and preserved for future generations. Paul was able to preach the highest and lowest in the land. This concludes the inspired histories of Luke, the beloved physician and constant companion of Paul. We have no further biblical accounts of the characters mentioned in the New Testament except in letters. We have no biblical accounts of what happened to any of them. We must rely on uninspired histories written by those who knew them. Eusebius, an early church historian. 
In Luke's history, called Acts of the Apostles, we have seen the establishment of the church in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and in the utmost parts of the earth. Paul said the gospel and preached to every creature that is under heaven in his lifetime. Now it's up to us and every generation to the end of time to keep the spirit and message alive, sowing the gospel seed into the hearts of each new congregation. The gospel is still being preached everywhere. Alice Jones has a last uh, poem. He said, Generations come and generations go. The earth's surface changes and men move to and fro. The famous and the not so are born and live and die, and God's great net keeps gathering as time keeps passing by. The sorting time is coming when he'll throw the bad away, but think of all the good ones he'll be keeping on that day. Noah's there, and Abraham, and maybe even Lot, but some like Cain and Judas, maybe so, maybe not. I want to talk to Peter. I'd like to visit Paul. And since it is eternity, I could see them all. But will I recognize them when I see them there? We will know as we are known, and our stories we will share. God left us a road map, one that all can follow. But many of its teachings some find hard to swallow. There's just one highway, the well-lit gospel way. It's simple to get on it, but on it we must stay. It's also like a stairway that goes from earth to heaven. When you begin to climb it, your sins are then forgiven. There's one who climbs it with you, it's Jesus always there, but he will not be happy if his love you will not share. So bring a brother with you and bring a sister too. You will feel so much better if they make that climb with you. Yes, generations come and generations go. It's important how you live and also whom you know. I hope you've enjoyed this study. May God continue to bless you.